Psalm chapter 85, verse number 6. The Bible reads, Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Notice he says, Wilt thou not revive us again? You know, that's the name of a very famous song. Revive us again. And listen, you know, America needs revival, and America wants revival. In fact, the majority of my life, I've grown up in church. I've heard many different churches, and I've heard it in the media. We need revival. We want revival. But unfortunately, most people don't even know what the word revival means. Most people are looking for some sort of an emotional experience. Just get me excited, turn me on for the Lord, or push this. You know, everybody talks about the easy button. There's just one little button you can push, and all of a sudden, revival would break out in America. But that's not really biblical revival. Spiritual revival in the Bible is always dealing with people that are already children of God. They're already saved and it's reviving them again, getting them back to the Lord. And you know, it always happens. We're going to look at a few mentions of the word revival this morning. And in every place in the Bible that it talks about spiritual revival, it talks about God's people Turning back to God first. Listen, you have to repent of your sins as a Christian to have revival in your life. Now look, you don't have to repent of your sins to become a Christian. You do not have to repent of all your sins and turn from all your wicked ways to be saved. But once you are saved, if you want God's will in your life to be worked out, if you want God's blessing in your life, then you need to repent for revival. This is a concept found throughout all the Bible, and the world does not even know what revival means. They don't even understand the true meaning of revival. Very famous verse in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, it reads, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, and shall pray, and seek my face, listen to this, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven... And will forgive their sin and will heal their land. My people called by my name, God says, listen, if you're saved today, if you're a born again, Bible believing Christian, God wants you to turn from your sin, to repent from the wickedness that you've allowed in your life, turn to him and he will heal your house. He will heal your heart. He will give you revival. Yet he may even yet heal this land. He may fix Jacksonville, Florida. He may fix America. If the Christians of this land would turn from their worldliness, from their fleshly desires, from the things they had allowed into their life, and actually serve God, then God would give them true biblical revival. God would revive them in their spirit. God would give them spiritual life, new life, refreshed life, a new perspective on God. Again, biblical revival is not the world turning to Christ. And I think people misunderstand this because even in the history of America, if you go back to the early 1800s, you go back 200 years, there was a revival in America. Unfortunately, there was a lot of false revival, if you will. There were false religions getting an emotional response out of people, get them excited, giving them bad information, and and the result was, you know, a bunch of confusion. People, well, you know, he's coming back. Jesus is coming back in 1844. Well, guess what? That didn't happen. A bunch of people were disappointed in America. And then in the 1900s, you had the same thing. You know, America was damaged by war and financial ruin and from the bankers and the Federal Reserve. And there was, there was great uh, 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 famine in the land and people were hurting And so finally, you know, they they turned to God. They decided, okay, let's turn to God. And there was somewhat of a revival 100 years ago. Well, here we are. I believe there's a pattern. I believe America is prosperous and as blessed as we are. I believe God may judge America and calls us to go back to a famine and calls us to go without and to maybe even be riddled with war again if we as Christians don't turn back to God. It's time for Americans... For people here in Floridians, for Jacksonvillians, if you will, to turn back to God. And it's not just, hey, let's get the masses to turn to the churches. No. Let's get the Christians to repent of the sin that's in their life. 
to turn to God with a pure heart to clean up their lives so that God can use them to do great and mighty things in our country. Revival is Christians seeking God's will in their life. Unfortunately, most people don't even know what revival is. And of course, most people in America don't even know what biblical salvation is. Salvation has always been by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, as your God, as the only way to prevent yourself from going to hell. Salvation has always been by believing, by trusting in the Lord. It's never been by works. It's never been by turning from your sin. But now that you are saved, it's time to get some sin out of your life so God can use you. In Romans chapter 4, he says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Righteousness is a word that's often mysterious to people. People will misuse the word righteous. And righteous simply means to do the right thing. To make sure you're doing the right thing. To be perfect in a sense, right? in, a, in a fleshly sense. And no one in here could say, well, I always do the right thing. I don't think there's anybody that could honestly say they're righteous in the flesh. The Bible teaches two different types of righteousness. There is righteousness in your spirit, in your soul, for believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. You put your faith and trust that Jesus died for every sin you'll ever commit, even the ones that you're still holding on to, even the ones you didn't really say sorry for. He died for every sin, not just the little ones, the big ones too. Once you recognize that and you trust in that alone, you are saved forever. And you're righteous in that spirit, in the soul. You're righteous in God's eyes forever. But now God wants you to work toward becoming righteous in the flesh. You need to work to be a Christian, if you will. Look, you're saved by faith alone. But now that you're a Christian, God wants you to do good works. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. If you get saved and you never do any good works, you're still going to heaven instead of hell, but God's blessing will not be on your life. Listen, if you want personal revival, if you want God's blessing on your life, you need to be willing to let go of the sin, let go of the things that are holding you back spiritually, and forsake those things and search for God. John 3.16. John 3.16 is a, is a no-brainer. Whosoever believeth in Him... Whosoever, it doesn't say whosoever worketh their way to heaven. Whosoever believeth in Him has everlasting life. Whoso, if all you have to do is trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're saved forever. And that is eternal righteousness. But right now, while you're on this earth, you're in the flesh to gain temporary righteousness. You have to work for it. You have to work to get the sin out of your life. You have to repent of your sin as a Christian to have God's blessing in your life to have revival. And understand, if you never do that, if you say, well, I got that sin, I've been holding on to it, I'm not willing to let it go, hey, thank God you're already saved, but beware, God will correct His children. God will chasten His children. He will correct them. He will put a curse on their physical life instead of a physical blessing to get your attention. There is even a sin unto death, the Bible teaches, that if you refuse to acknowledge that God, His commandments, and you continue to disobey Him, God may end your physical life early that your soul will go straight to heaven. He'll bring you home early. And listen, we don't want that. If you want God's blessing on your life, If you want revival in your life, in your city, in this country, it starts with you being willing to turn from your sin on a personal level. In Revelation 1, he says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. There is a promise of a blessing if you read your Bible... You listen to the prophecy, you listen to the preaching, and you obey the commandments that are written in the Bible, God will bless you. And if America is to be blessed, if America is to have a revival, it starts with the Christians turning back to God. We as Christians, we look in the world and we say, oh man, it's getting rough. Boy, look at those people. You know what they're doing now? You know what they're teaching in the public schools? Oh, do you know what they're they're putting on TV? Listen, that's not our problem. Our problem is the churches. 
Our problem is our own family, our own self as an individual. Are you getting the sin out of your life? Because if you're not getting the sin out of your life, who are you to judge some unsaved person for living like the world? Living like the devil. Hey, they're taken captive by the devil's will. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. You're without excuse. It's time to clean up your life to be used by God. This is a choice we have to make once we're saved. In 2 Corinthians 7, he says, Having therefore these promises, Dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. God's will for your life because you know you have promises in heaven, eternal rewards to look forward to, is that you cleanse yourself. You get the filthiness of the world out of your life. And then once you repent of the sin as a Christian, God will give you revival as a child of God. God will give you His Spirit. He will pour it out without measure unto you. And you will be able to prophesy mightily to others. You will be able to get others saved. You can be used by God if you're willing to cleanse your own life. It's the decision we all have to make. In James 1, he says, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. Whoever looks into the Bible, recognizes what God says, and does what God says, you will be blessed. That's his promise. Do you want revival in your life? Do you want to see revival in your family? Do you have extended family members you would love to see them on fire for the Lord? Do you look in the mirror and say, I I just wish I had that zeal. I wish I had the excitement. I wish I could overcome these sins. I wish my children would grow up recognizing the power of God and the Holy Spirit of God and knowing the Scriptures of God. Well, it starts with you. It starts with you, Mom and Dad. It starts with you as an individual. It starts with you getting things right in your life, and then God will empower you to reach others. Listen, there's faith righteousness in your soul and in your spirit. Once saved, always saved. But then once you are saved, if you're willing to turn from the sin in your life, there is a works righteousness in this flesh. You can cleanse this body from the filthiness, from the things that are holding you back, from the temptations the devil is using to ensnare you from doing mighty things for God. You're in Psalm 85. Let's back up a look and then just look at this in context. Look at verse number 2. Psalm 85, verse number 2. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sin. So we're looking at Psalm 85 here because he's talking about revive us again. Notice he didn't say revive us for the first time. Revival is reinvigorating. It's putting that life and that energy and that zeal back in you. So listen, he says, my people. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of my people. You, God has forgiven the sins of the Christians, and they need to be revived again. He says, thou hast covered all their sin. Did he say he's covered some of the sin? No, he says all of the sin. Well, but Brother Fannin, you know, I know this guy, and he's saved, but boy, he is a stinking drunk. Well, is that sin paid for? Yep. Amen. Yes, it is. He is saved. That sin's paid for. But if he, as an individual, will be willing to get rid of that sin, God can use them more. Listen, in Ezekiel, it talks about that our sins will not be mentioned unto us. In Isaiah, it talks about that he will cast them behind his back. When God forgives your sin, he chooses to forget your sin. Only God can do that. We, We need to follow that example. In Psalm 103, he says that it is as far as the east is from the west. The east and the west will never meet. He has forgiven all of our sin. Once you're saved, even if you do something terrible like murder or suicide, those are sins that God has already paid for. Thank God. Praise the Lord. It's not by our own works of righteousness because if it were, we would all fail. We would all fall. No one would get to heaven. He's given us a free gift. You can't buy it. You don't have to be good to keep the gift. It's totally free. And it's everlasting life. Once you have that free gift, you literally have it forever. Beyond the grave. Beyond this life. Beyond a million years. It's everlasting life. God's made us that promise. But here He's saying, revive us again. This is my people, He says. He says, thy people, verse 2. This is God's people saying, Lord, revive us. Lord, re-energize us. Lord, give us that zeal again. Look at verse 3. 
Thou hast taken all thy wrath. Thou hast turned thyself from the fierceness of thine anger. You know, Jesus took the punishment that we deserve of our sins. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. What The wage is what you earn. We have earned death and hell. The second death. Jesus died and went to hell for my sins. So I don't have to go. I trust in Him alone to be saved. And now that I am saved, He's taken away all that wrath. Now, as an individual, in my personal life, in this fleshly life, I need to be willing to obey and turn from sin. And He will bless me. Look at verse 4. Turn us. O God of our salvation, and cause thine anger toward us to cease. So what's happening here, God's people were being judged as a nation because of the nation's sin. God's people had refused to obey. They didn't care about going to church. They didn't care about reading the Bible. Hey, they were walking with the worldly people, and God said, okay, then I'm going to judge you all to get your attention. So we're saying, okay, Lord, you're judging us. Please revive us, get reinvigorate us, return us, restore us to thy grace. In 1 John 1, he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Listen, in 1 John, that's at the end of the Bible right here. Okay, This was written how to be saved. At the end of the Bible, it's saying, now that you're saved, this is how you should live. The book of Hebrews, the book of James, the first John, Peter, those books are written to tell you how to live as a Christian. And now that you are saved and all of your sin was paid for, once you sin again, you should confess your sin, admit to God that you're wrong, and then He will reduce the punishment, if you will. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We as a nation need to cleanse ourselves. We as individuals need to cleanse ourselves. And it starts in the flesh. If you're already saved, you're clean in the Spirit, but now you need to get clean in the flesh and God will bless you. Look at verse number 5. Wilt thou be angry with us forever? Wilt thou draw out thine anger to all generations? Again, thank God He forgives and He forgets. Verse 6. Wilt thou not revive us again? that thy people may rejoice in thee. He's saying, Lord, your people, the Christians in America and in Jacksonville, need rejoicing. And the only way they're going to get it is by repenting and turning to God. And then He will revive us. He will give us the power to do great and mighty things. Look at verse 7. He says, Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for He will speak peace unto His people and to His saints. Let them not turn again to folly. Look how he ends there in verse 8. This is very important. He says, you're my people. You are saints already. Hey, tell that to the Catholic Church. Some big idol, some big statue of some saint. You know, they even have a saint for the TV. They, they, uh, they literally have a saint, a glow-in-the-dark idol, little statue you can sit there. It's the saint to the TV. So while the commercial is on, you can pray to that saint. They tell the Catholics the saints are the believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is God's people. That's who a saint is. You say, well, are you telling me you're perfect? Well, no. I'm perfect in the Spirit. I am a saint in God's eyes. I am far from perfect in the flesh, but I ought to try. I ought to get better. I need to repent of my sin so God will bless me in the flesh. So he says we're His people. We're His saints. And look how he ends this. Let them not turn again to folly. Folly is foolishness. Go to Ezra chapter 9. Ezra chapter number 9. What's he saying here? He's saying, God, revive us and keep us from going back to that sin again. Lord, help us. We want to turn from our sin. We want to turn to God. We want His Spirit on us. We want His blessing. And Lord, please protect us from going back to that sin again. And unfortunately, that's what's happened in America. Too many Christians... They get in fire for God. They get saved. They're doing the right thing. They're in church and then they fall out. Well, don't you know the Super Bowl's on today? Don't you? I mean, that's, I mean, what, there's 50, 60 people in here today. I bet you there'd be 70 if it wasn't football Sunday. If it wasn't Super Bowl Sunday. Some people, oh, they're just getting ready. Listen, as a Christian, you need to get as excited for God and His Word as you do for football. Right. Listen, Pastor said it just a little while ago. He said football in itself is not necessarily a sin. But when you put football before God, it becomes a sin. 
right? Your hobby is not necessarily a sin. Hunting is not a sin. But if you lay out a church because you're in the woods, that's a sin. And he's saying, Lord, help us. We don't want to turn back to this folly. We don't want to go back to a foolish way. Lord, revive us. Invigorate us. Give us your spirit. Fill us with the Holy Spirit so we can be on fire for you. And America's crying for that, but they, I don't think they understand that it's their, the ball is in their court. It's their choice, their decision to choose to turn for, to God. To choose to turn from those habits. Some of the younger, well, I don't really care about football. Well, what about Instagram? Uh-oh. Hey, what about Facebook? What about YouTube? If you cared as much about the Bible and turning to God as you did to see what your friends did last night, well, then we would have true revival in America. We as Christians need to get our face out of Facebook and our face in His book, and God will bless us. We as Christians need to repent of our sins, and He will bless us, and then use us mightily to turn others unto the Lord. And listen, you don't have to repent of your sins to become a Christian. Thank God. But now that you are, if you refuse to repent of your sins, God will judge you. God will not bless that. If you choose to hold on to sin instead of getting right with God, do you think God would bless that? Look, He loves us. He wants us to keep His commandments. He will bless us if we obey Him. If your children disobey you, do you reward them? No. You correct them. Right? In, in, in John 1, 12, He says, To them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. Now that you're a son of God, now that you're a daughter of God because you have put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's time to obey your Father and He will bless you. He will help you prosper. In Romans 8, He says, So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. When you're choosing to walk in the flesh instead of walk in the Spirit, it's impossible for the flesh to please God. In Galatians 5, he says, This then I say, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you're walking as a spiritual person, then you cannot sin against God's law. You have no need for the law because you're right with God. This is the day-by-day, moment-by-moment choice that we as Christians have to make. Will we walk in the flesh or walk in the Spirit? And if we repent of walking in the flesh and turn to walking in the Spirit, God will greatly bless us. In 2 Corinthians 5, he says, And he, that he died for all, that they which, which live, that's us, we're alive, he says, they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose. Listen, you have been given spiritual life forever. And you should live for Christ. We shouldn't live unto ourselves, but unto Christ. We need to live unto Him. And how do we do that? How do we recognize when there's problems? In 1 John, he gave us a very easy litmus test. He says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Do you find yourself more in love with the things of the world than the things of God? Well, I just love that. It's my team. You don't understand. I've always followed that team. Well, why don't you follow Team Jesus Christ? Right? Why don't you quit worrying about the Super Bowl and worry about the superpower that created you? Start worrying about the will of your Father in heaven, which is to go and to bear much fruit, to bring others unto Him. He says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. How do I know when I'm sinning against the Father? How do I know when I'm not walking in the Spirit? Well, you're in the flesh when you're lusting after things, lusting after flesh, or having pride of life. Boy, yeah, we got it figured out. We got that big house, that big car, that big job. We got everything we ever wanted. Woe unto you. Woe unto you. Listen, oh, oh, if you're lusting after things in this world, all, all I can think about is getting that bigger truck. That bigger car, getting that fancy car, getting them fancy rims, right? I, I need that biggest phone. Have you seen that phone that takes two hands to hold? That's the one I want, right? Listen, forget about that stuff. Pick up your Bible and obey God. You're in Ezra chapter 9. This is a really cool chapter. Ezra chapter 9. We're going to see where the people of God begin to turn back to God and they get blessed by God. Look at verse number 5. Ezra 9, verse number 5. And at the evening sacrifice, I arose up from my heaviness. 
And having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God. Now when he said, what he's saying is he was so grieved, he was so heavy in the spirit, he tore his shirt, he tore his jacket, and he said, like, this stuff don't matter. I'm so upset because of where we are at in our standing with God. Right? What he do? He falls down. He puts his hands, he spreads his hands out unto the Lord. Verse 6, he says, And said, Oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face. Do you notice the phrase in the Bible, Oh my God, is a prayer. Listen, we should not use God's name in vain. You should not go around and say, OMG, OMG. No, listen, when you say, Oh my God, it needs to be to talk to God. To pray to God. To say, I'm ashamed of the sin of my nation. I'm ashamed of the things I've allowed as an individual into my life. Oh my God, please forgive me. Will you get down on your face and cry to God? Oh my God, I trust in Thee. Let me not be ashamed. Will you lift up your voice unto God? Look what He does here. He's crying out for the sin of His nation. He's asking for God to bless them. He's saying we need to turn and get back to God and God will bless us. He said, look at verse 6. Let's start over. He says, Oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to Thee. My God, for our iniquities are increased over our head and our trespass is grown up under the heavens. He's saying our sin is so bad. It's gotten so big. It's like a mountain. What are we going to do about this mountain of sin? Oh my God, we need Your help. Look at verse 7. Since the days of our fathers... Have we been in great trespass unto this day? Trespass means you broke the law. They're saying we've been breaking God's law over and over. He says, And for our iniquities have we, our kings and our priests, been delivered into the hand of the kings of the land, to the sword and to captivity and to spoil and confusion of face as it is this day. He's saying because of our mountain of sin that we've allowed to get in between us and our relationship with God, God has judged our nation, He's judged our people, He's judged our city, He's judged our families, and He's judging the individuals. He says we're under attack with the sword. We're in captivity. We're enslaved to evil people. He said they've spoiled us. They've taken all the good and left us the waste. He says and now we have confusion of face. You look around in the churches today, people calling for a revival. There's confusion on their face because they don't understand. It starts with them. If you choose to repent of your sins once you're saved, then God will give you revival and use you mightily. We're in captivity right now in America to the pagans. We are in captivity to a bunch of devil-worshipping, God-hating weirdos that want to hurt your family. They want to destroy your mind. They want to pollute your heart. They want to treat, teach you strange doctrine. Hey, listen, the, the Bible talks about the end times, that there's a, a great conspiracy and what we would call it today as a new world order. That the devil is establishing his kingdom right now. He is setting things up so when the Antichrist arrives, he can rule the whole world through the banks, through the TV, through Hollywood. Hey, it's happening in front of us right now. And we're allowing our children to watch some of this stuff. We're allowing ourselves to watch some of this stuff. If you go home and watch the Super Bowl ads tonight, you know what you're going to see? The devil. The New World Order. These agendas being pushed down your throat. Well, they're just born that way. Let them be that way. Right? Oh, you need to be accepting of everybody no matter what they do. A little bit of drunkenness is okay. The Bible says not even to look at it. Don't even look at the wine, it says. Here he's saying, I'm ashamed and I blush because of what our nation has done, where we've come. And listen, once America was great for God, there was a time that America was known as conservative Christian values. And now I think we have like a very little remnant. We just have a few people trying to hold on, saying, Lord, what's going to happen here? Is this it? Is the end nigh? What's going to happen next? We're afraid. We don't know what to do. But listen, it starts in your own heart. Get right with God. Get right with that sin. Get that sin out of your life. The things that you've been holding on to, you need to ask God to help you to hate that sin and to help you turn from that sin. And He will turn you into a new person. He will revive your spirit. Look what he says in verse 8 here. And now, for a little space, grace 
hath been showed from the Lord our God. He's saying, God, give us a little chance. Lord, listen, America is due the judgment of God. As many abortions as we let it happen, as many wars as we're starting all around the world, America is due the judgment of God. God would be righteous to wipe it off the map tomorrow. Lord, please give us a little grace. Lord, give us a chance to turn this thing around. Lord, help us as individuals to start out in the right direction. He's saying God has shown us a little space. Grace hath been shown. We've got a little bit of time here where we're overdue judgment that we have grace under God. He has not given us what we deserve. And we as individuals, we as Christians, we as churches need to turn ourselves around and turn our families around and turn our churches around. Then we can turn our city around. Then we can turn this nation around. Maybe it's possible to stop the judgment that we're due. Maybe it's possible that God will will not give us what we deserve, give us our just desserts, and give us more of a little space to show some grace to others, to preach the gospel to others. Let's start over again. He says, and now for a little space, grace hath been showed from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape. That's us. We're just a little remnant. We're just a little remainder. And give us a nail in this holy place that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. He says, Lord, give us a little revival. You've given us a little grace. Now, if we can just nail something down and we can have something to stand on, we have the Word of God. We can trust in this. If you'll start standing on this and you'll nail something into you, say, hey, you know what? I'm going to stand on this verse. I'm going to work on this verse. I'm going to work on reading the Word of God. Begin to nail these principles down in your life. Then God will give you a little reviving. He'll encourage your spirit. He'll fill you with the Holy Spirit. And then when you go back to the Bible, you'll understand it more. You'll apply it more. He'll bring things to your remembrance. He's saying, give us life again. He says, Lord, we've, you've barely given us a little bit of grace here. Now give us a little bit of life. Revive us. Look at verse 9. For we were bondmen, yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage. Yet, I said, but hath extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia to give us reviving. What's revival for? Think about this. Why do we need a revival in America? So we can reestablish. We can protect our family. So we can protect the churches. So we can protect God's people. Look what he says. He says, give us a, a reviving to set up the house of God and repair the desolations thereof And give us a wall in Judah and Jerusalem. He's saying, Lord, reinvigorate us. Re-empower us. Reinstate us. Protect us, Lord. Give us a wall of defense from the filthiness of the world. Well, it starts in your heart. It starts with the individual. This little remnant is begging, Lord, revive us. Revitalize us. Give us life. Look at verse 10. And now, O our God... What shall we say after this? For we have forsaken thy commandments, which thou hast commanded by thy servants the prophets, saying, The land unto which you go to possess it is an unclean land with the filthiness of the people of the lands, with their abominations which they have filled it from one end to another with their uncleanness. He said, look, you broke God's law. He said, don't involve yourself with the filthiness of the land. Don't be drunk. Don't fornicate. Listen, don't involve yourself with what the wicked world wants to do. Don't say it's acceptable. Well, I think everybody can do what they want. Well, you know what? God said something already. He said no. He said this is right. That is wrong. And He's commanded us to judge these things. If you know it it goes against God's law, you need to stand up and say that. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. There's filthiness in the land. There's abominations in America. From one end unto another, it's uncleanness. We're surrounded by the enemy because we broke God's law. We lowered our standard, but God's standard has not changed. His commandment is unwavering. It's always good from the beginning to the end. It always applies. What changed? Our heart, our spirit, our perspective of God and His judgment. It's time for Christians to quit being filthy, repent of their sins, and have personal revival in their life. And then God can restore our country. 
In 2 Corinthians, he says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle, we say in this body, our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. He says, hey, know this and be thankful that when this body falls apart, when this body falls away and you die, you have a new body in heaven, you have new life with Christ in heaven, but until then, let's keep our eyes up there, not down here. Not on this flesh that's falling apart. Let's keep our focus and our goal. That is the end game. That is the end of the race is to get to heaven. To fulfill God's will. You're in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Find verse 31. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Find verse number 31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. What's he saying? Well, we all, we all eat. We all drink. We all just kill a little bit of time. Watch a little bit of YouTube. Look at a little bit of Facebook. Watch a little bit of TV. Are you doing those things to the glory of God? Are you using your idle time for the glory of God? You think about it. And, 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 and I'm going to pick on TV watchers for a minute. I watch TV for years and I don't anymore. But if you would just shut off the TV when the commercial comes on and open your Bible, do you know how much Bible reading you could get done in a week? Just think about that alone. Like, would I mean, if you would just read your Bible during the commercials, and that way you can say, well, at least I did something for the glory of God with what little bit of time I had in the evening, with what little bit of relaxing I had. Listen, do you want relaxing or do you want reviving? If you want revival in your life, then quit relaxing the way the world does and get on fire for God. Amen. Open up your Bible. Turn off the TV. Don't just relax and sit back and watch a movie. Well, I'm, I'm not really enjoying it, but i got 45 minutes left. I already started it on the Hulu, on the Amazon. i, I got I got 45 minutes left. It's not that good, but I'm just going to keep watching anyway because I want to know how it ends. Hey, you know how this ends? You end up standing before God in His presence. He rewards you for what you do. And then you go on to eternity to rule and to reign with Him. Do you want to actually rule and reign? Or do you just want to, well, I'm glad I'm here. Oh, praise the Lord, I'm a doorkeeper. You ought to have an attitude that says, wait a minute, if there's still breath in my lungs and there's still hope for my life, and I'm already saved and I've got God's Holy Spirit. Why don't you do something great for God with your life? Start by getting the sin out of your life. Start by getting on fire about reading your Bible for yourself. Let me ask you this. It's easy to relax instead of revive. How many of you in here could say, well, I, I, I've studied my Romans road well enough to be able to tell my family how to get saved. How many would say, well, I've read my proverb of the day and I'm reading through the Bible in a year. Listen, if you read the Bible for 15 minutes a day, you'll read it in one year. If you read it for an hour a day, you'll read it four times in a year. It ought to be said of Christians that they at least know how to lead somebody else to the Lord. How to take any Bible, open it up, Start in John 3. Start in Romans 3. There's nothing wrong with the Romans road. It works just fine. I have a brother from, from uh, Tallahassee that was visiting us last year. And he and I went out soul winning. We went out preaching the gospel to strangers. And he doesn't use the Romans road. Now the Romans road is great. There's nothing wrong with it. I use a modified version. And, and he was all over the place in his Bible. And you know what? He preached the same gospel. He told the same story of Jesus Christ, how that He is God and Savior. And He developed His own plan of salvation by studying the Word of God. And there's nothing wrong with it. You say, hey, well, I'm simple. Okay, then just Google the Romans road. And then add something to it. You need some eternal security. You need to add the things. You need to uh, learn your Bible and, uh, to revive yourself, to be able to revive others. Instead of relaxing, get the Romans road down. Instead of relaxing, get on fire for understanding the Scriptures well enough to save your own family. To tell them what Christ has done for them. Look up here in 1 Corinthians 10. Let's read it again. Verse 31, it says, Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Even as I please all men in all things, listen, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many that they may be saved. The profit of many that they may be saved. What did the Apostle Paul do with his spare time? 
Do you think he went down to the theater? Do you think he read some worldly book? No, he studied the Word of God for the profit of a bunch of other people. Well, that doesn't sound very fun. Yeah, but it was profitable spiritually, eternally for a bunch of other people because he was willing to sacrifice his own time. Go to Romans chapter 8 and we'll be done. Romans chapter number 8. In Isaiah 57, he says that, uh, that he, he says, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. Who is the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity? That's God. Whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit. He's saying, you want to dwell with me in heaven? Have a humble spirit. Have a contrite spirit. Contrite means remorseful. Hey, repentant. Willing to admit when you're wrong. He says, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. If you're in here today and you're saved, and you say, I just can't seem to get on fire for God. I just can't seem to get this sin out of my life. Humble yourself. Be contrite. Be remorseful about the sin that has taken over your life. Get on your knees and cry out, Oh my God, I'm ashamed. I blush at what I've let my life become. Lord, help me to raise my family the right way. Lord, help me to teach others how to be saved. Lord, help me to have an excitement to open up the Bible and to read it. If we cry to God with those things, He will answer. You're in Romans chapter 8. Look at verse number 1. He says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Like Pastor was talking about earlier, he said, hey, you know, when we stand before God at the judgment seat, is all of your works going to burn up? No, I hope not. Or are you going to have something remaining? He's saying here, there is no condemnation. Nobody in this world or in heaven can look at you and say you're wrong when you're walking in the Spirit. If you're choosing to let the Holy Spirit lead you and guide you, and He's given you the instruction manual, have you read it lately? If you'll let the Holy Spirit lead you and guide you, He will give you revival. And there's no condemnation. Look at verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. We talked about that law of liberty. The law of liberty is the Bible. It is the law that sets you free. It is the law that sets you at liberty. We were in bondage. We deserve hell. We understand who the Lord Jesus Christ is. We are made free forever. So he says, the law of the spirit of life in Christ, there is a law that if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, in your spirit, you will have life forever. Hath made me free from, look at the last part of this, the law of sin and death. There is a law still in your body because you're still in the body of sin and death. The law is this, if you sin, you will die. The law is this, if you live like the world, your body will fall apart quicker. The law is this, if you disobey God, He may destroy this body and bring your soul home earlier. Do you want God's blessing on your life? Do you want to please God with the time that you have left on this earth? Look at verse number 8. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Oh, I just like taking a little drink on the weekends. You can't please God. Well, I just like, I mean, I know that movie's a little bit of a dirty and it uses bad, but it's just okay. I just let a little bit of it. You can't please God when you're allowing that. If you want to please God, you need to get serious about getting the sin out of your life, having your own personal revival, and then God will empower you through the Holy Spirit to revive others as well. Look at verse 13. For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. When you walk in the Spirit, you have the power to put to death the works of the flesh. And through the Spirit, you have the ability to speak life into others. To have a blessing from God. Look, our faith in Jesus Christ brings us eternal life. There is no condemnation to your soul if you've trusted 
in the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, to, to them that believe all things. You're justified from all things if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But once you're saved, your walk, whether it's in the flesh or the spirit, will determine whether you can have revival. Our walk after salvation determines whether we're blessed of God or cursed of God in this flesh, in this world. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Well, uh, you know, he died for all my sins. It's okay if I just take that drink, do this thing. That's not that bad of a sin. You're deceiving yourself is what the Bible says. But yet if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteous. Lord, I'm back again. I sinned again. Lord, please help me again. And he'll say, I'll revive you again. But it starts with our willingness to acknowledge the sin in our life. And then He will revive us again. He will forgive us again and again and again. Jesus told us as Christians, we need to forgive our brothers and sisters in Christ. They said seven times, Lord. He said seven times 70. Hey, forgive them 500 times. How many times do you think God will forgive you when you come with a humble heart? Lord, I did it again. I'm so sorry. I, uh, my, this stupid flesh of mine, I can't seem to control it. Lord, forgive me. He says, I'll forgive you. You say, Lord, revive me again. He says, I'll forgive you again. I'll revive you again. The Lord loves us. The Lord wants us to be used of him. God's spirit is dwelling inside of us to help us to be able to know God's will and to do God's will. And if we choose to obey him, we can have revival in our life. One of the verses I started with, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land and heal their house and heal their life and revive us again. Do you want revival in your life? Are you willing to say, Lord, I want to get this sin out. I want to deal with it. Listen, don't forswear yourself. Never come to the Lord saying, I promise I'm done. I'll never do it again. You'll be right back on your face tomorrow. Right? We need to make our words true to the Lord. You need to say, Lord, I want to quit. I don't know if I can. I'm trying. Will you help me? Will you ask Him and put it in His hand and learn to have confidence in Him instead of forswearing yourself and making all these big promises that you can't keep? There's many, many lost Americans. They're on their way to hell and we can help them if we will repent of our sins, then He will revive us again and we can preach the Gospel. We may be, may be able to save our country from destruction if we'll start in our own heart. Start in our own life. Jesus said the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are fruit. He, he says there's so many people that need to be saved, but the laborers are few. But there's so little Christians actually doing the work. He said, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that He will send forth laborers into His harvest. If you're saved today, pray that God would use you as a laborer to go into the harvest. To get other souls saved for Him. Let's pray.